Oh, physics folks, we're gonna do some coverage on energy principles in our lab simulations and demonstrations. And what we're gonna do is just cover some basics on energy, just a quick recap, and look at some of the mechanics of energy transfers, conservation of energy principles that come into play with a lot of problem solving that you will see in many, many demonstrations and many, many um, standard physics problems. Okay, so let's just review some energy. What is it? It's the ability to do work, right? So if I push around an object, maybe push, move the earth around, I am doing work and I am doing work on this object and it's moving over a certain distance, okay? So what's happening is I'm transferring energy by doing that work. So energy is the ability to do work on an object. What is work? So a quick review. Work is if you apply a constant force, it's a force over a distance, and that's what we use to move books around on tables, right? Force applied over a distance, so I'm putting work into this object. I'm doing work on this object. And if it's constant, it's just force times your displacement, okay? If it's a varying force, then we have to do our integrals. So it's the integral of f dx, okay? So we have two different types of works we will wanna look at when we're talking about energies. And uh, this is the basis behind the kinds of forces at work. So we have non-conservative forces and conservative forces. And in mechanical energy conservation, we really wanna concentrate on conservative forces. Uh, and look at the energy conservation from that. So cons conservative forces are energy that you could, you could recover. So the idea is um, there's a certain amount of energy by holding up this baseball in different positions. And that has to do with the gravitational field, the energy that's stored in the gravitational field that I get that potential energy from. So depending upon its position, I have a certain amount of potential energy. So the idea is if I hold this baseball up, I know it's gonna fall due to gravity. We've done plenty of those experiments. I let go and it drops to its lowest position here. And all that energy is going from potential energy from gravity into kinetic energy, the energy of motion, when it hits, strikes the surface but I could recover that energy. I could just lift it right back up and get that same amount of energy as long as it's the same height. So it's recoverable. So conservative forces are things like gravity, uh, electromagnetic forces in some form, like you can move charges around and you could get that, you could recover that energy from those. So conservative forces are, are forces where you could recover the energy from, okay? Uh, Non-conservative forces are forces like friction or heat when you lose, like in this case, when I drop this ball and you hear the sound, that can't be recovered. Uh, so I'm losing some of that energy into other formats. So there's non-conservative forces at work there. So uh, friction is one of those key players in mechanics. So you always have to identify what forces are in the system that you're analyzing the energy transfers in, and whether you could apply conservation of mechanical energy principles here. Now, uh, let's back up a little bit. There's many types of energies, and they all transfer from one form to another. So we know that we have, like, we have chemical energy, like the energy stored in batteries, chemical, nuclear. Uh, we have heat energy. We have sound energy. We have rest mass energy. Everything potentially has this E equals mc squared relation. Rest mass energy, E is short for energy. Uh, other types, the ones that we're really gonna focus on are potential energy. And that's energy stored in the field of that force. So uh, we have a lot of energy stored in the gravitational field, and this will be the big one that we'll be looking at. And then we have the energy of motion called kinetic energy. Um, and of course you have electrical energy, magnetic energy, and the list goes on and on. Okay, so, so many. So 
when you look at things on an everyday basis, there's all kinds of energy transfers, right? I take a sip of my coffee. Mm. Good stuff. I get that chemical energy so that I can write on the board and convert that chemical energy into kinetic energy. Okay. So again, uh, our unit, I mean, the, the symbol we use for energy is just our straightforward E. The unit is a joule, same unit as with work. And a joule is composed of one joule equals one newton times one meter. And you can see the composition of force and displacement in those units. Okay, so some big ideas here. Conservation of energy, which is at the heart of these problems in our lab. Energy is neither created nor destroyed, it's always conserved. So the same amount of energy we had at the beginning of the universe exists now, theoretically, right? So we haven't found a violation of that. So what we know is that the initial energy of any system, so it's really important to identify your system, is always going to equal the final energy of your system. But that includes all the internal energy, the heat energy, uh, the chemical energy in that system, all combined so this gives you a number of joules before something happens and then sometime later you have a certain amount of joules afterward okay now what we want to look at is conservation of e mechanical mechanical energy okay and that's where we're going to apply our problem solving skills to and we'll see that a lot of the problems that we did using newton's second law can be done using conservation of energy principles. So conservation of mechanical energy is uh, the mechanical energy initially should equal the mechanical energy in the final stages. So what do we mean by mechanical energy? So when we're first studying energy and mechanics, we start with some few forms of energy. We have the energy of motion, which is kinetic. And we have two types of kinetic energy, so we're just going to start looking at translational kinetic energy, which is equal to one half mv squared. Okay, so you take anything, if you slide something across the table, okay. we have it's moving, it has kinetic energy, it's translating, in this case, that's the motion, it's translational motion, it's one half mv squared. But you could also have things rolling, like a ball. If I roll a ball across the table, it's translating and rolling, so it has also rotational kinetic energy, one half I omega squared, which we'll look at. Okay, so we have kinetic energies we're gonna look at, and then we have potential energy. So what we have is energy stored in the gravity field. So if you give anything a certain position above the ground, depending upon its position, it's gonna have a certain amount of potential energy. So if I, in this case, I'm gonna have it with respect to the desk, I'm gonna say this is my surface, it's zero at the zero point, and I hold it up about a meter above the desk, and I drop this, let's say, two kilogram baseball, and as it goes down and drops, that potential energy from gravity converts into kinetic energy. So it's all potential energy up here, based on its position with respect to the bottom, the, the desk, the zero point that you define, and all that potential energy converts into kinetic energy at the very bottom. So it becomes all kinetic energy just as it strikes a surface. So in the middle of its path, it's a combination, throughout its path, it's a combination of potential and kinetic energy until it drops. Now, it, what happens is with a ball like this, you know, I drop it and you hear a thump. So what happens in that case is some of that energy got converted into sound energy and an internal energy there. Okay, so I wasn't able to recover that. So there was some non-conservative forces at work. But in that process of falling from its position to the desk, all that was a mechanical process. So all that potential energy got dumped into kinetic energy with just a little bit of leakage of air resistance, but we could ignore that. We could say that whole process is all conservative forces. Okay, it's afterwards when you hear the thump and the transfer of some of the other internal energies, uh, you no longer have a mechanical 
energy conservation process at work. Okay. This ball right here, this racket ball, will have a little bit better chances of going up to its initial height. So if I drop this, I lose just a little bit of energy to internal and sound energy there. But um, so it's not all completely recovered, but the stage from dropping it from a meter height above the desk to the desk, all that we could analyze just using mechanical energy conservation. All potential energy to all kinetic energy the moment it strikes. Okay, so very important. So E mechanical energy conservation, what's gonna come into play in our problem solving is, this is all our kinetic plus potential before initially like with my ball drop at the very top okay before just as I release that ball that initial stage initially should equal all and I'll say K for short for kinetic that's the symbol we typically use K or KE plus potential U or PE final okay. so in these values you put all your kinetic energies at work and all your potential energies at work as well so not only do we have potential energy from gravity we also have the potential energy stored in springs so we have a few spring demos for you as well okay so something else to note energy always likes to go to its lowest form all things tend to the lowest form of energy so what we have here is a lot of transferring at work and we're going to be working with this formula right here and we're going to see that changes in kinetic energy potential energy should sum to zero based on this formula so uh, all these changes will equal zero as long as there's no conservative forces at work so this only holds when our work due to non-conservative forces is zero meaning it's only conservative forces in that system. So make sure you identify that correctly. Okay. Loop-de-loops, conservation of E, and circular motion, and Dr. E. All right, thank you. Uh, what I wanted to demonstrate here is that if you have a mass which can roll down a track, and that track is on a loop-de-loop -loop curve, then what you need to do in order to give it enough uh, velocity at the bottom so that it just makes it over the top is to give it a little extra potential energy at the top here because we don't want it to have, if I put it here, then if it's at the same level as the top of the track, then by the time it gets to the top of the track, it'll have zero velocity and it'll just fall. So it has to have a little bit of extra velocity that extra velocity that's necessary at the top, uh, I'll show in a minute, has to be equal to the square root of RG. So if I let this thing go, that's just that right amount of, uh, of uh, velocity at the bottom so that it has the square root of RG at the top. And so let's see how that would work on uh, the board here. If we uh, have a mass going round and round in a circle. At the top, we have the normal force, and uh, we have mg. So the sum of the inward forces toward the center of spin at the top is equal to mv squared over r, giving us f normal plus mg equals mv squared over r. Now at the critical point where the velocity is a minimum, that happens uh, at the top when the normal force is equal to zero. So if the normal force is zero in this equation, then this corresponds to the minimum velocity at the top, and that gives us uh, v squared equals rg, or v equals root. RG. Okay, so the velocity can't be zero at the top, it has to be the square root of RG. So if we started the ball here, 
then the potential would turn into kinetic, then back into potential, and the velocity would be zero when we got back up to that height. So we have to give it an extra amount of vertical height so that it has some velocity left over at the top of the path. Uh, such that the velocity is equal to the square root of rg. Now at the bottom, the velocity that's necessary for it to just make it over the top, the bottom, can be gotten from the fact that one half mv bottom squared plus zero, call this our zero reference position for potential energy, equals one half mv top squared plus mg times 2r. And but v top we have from this equation is the square root of rg, so this becomes one half m v bottom squared equals half m times r g plus m g times two uh, r. And if we multiply both sides through by two, cancel out the ends, we get v bottom squared equals rg plus 4rg, or v bottom equals square root of 5rg. So that is the minimum velocity at the bottom of the path so that it just makes it over the top, but just at this point having a normal force that's equal to zero where the normal force is not zero for points that are on either side of that top point. So technically it does leave the track, but it only leaves the track at one point. And so since it has zero time to leave the track, it doesn't leave the track. Hello folks, with me is Dr. Seth for doing another energy demonstration. And what you got there, Dr. Seth? A boomerang wheel. Awesome. How does, let's see how this thing works. We'll do a little demonstration and we'll try to figure out what in the world is going on. Okay, it's coming back to us. That's probably why they call it a boomerang wheel. Take a look at this energy conversion process again. So Seth energy to kinetic translational rotational energy and you see how it stopped there and now it rolls back. So what happened? That kinetic energy went into some other form of energy and then went back into kinetic energy. So what's in this mysterious wheel that stores that initial kinetic energy? Well what we have inside there is a hexagonal nut attached by an elastic band and as it rolls the elastic band coils up and has a store of elastic potential energy and that elastic potential energy then converts back into kinetic energy translational and rotational so that's the mystery of the boomerang wheel thank you dr seth Good demonstration. We'll give it one more turn. One more turn. Okay, let's see it go. Coils up and then releases that elastic potential energy back into kinetic energy. Awesome. And in this case, the energy is stored in the spring, potential energy. And how that gets converted to kinetic energy, the energy of motion. So we're looking at a mechanical process. And here we have three different springs of increasing order of stiffness. So this is less stiff, medium stiff, and most stiff. So does the stiffness of the spring, the spring constant K, make a difference in the potential energy storage that gets converted to kinetic energy using our conservation of energy principles. Well, let's take a look at this. We Here we have a 200 gram mass and the potential energy of a spring can be seen by the relation 
Potential energy is equal to one half kx squared, k being the stiffness of the spring, the x being the displacement. So this is a very light spring. So it's got not very much stiffness, okay? So if I go ahead and put that mass on the end of the spring and I let go, whoa, we need more room to make it oscillate. It'll oscillate back and forth, back and forth. And it would do that indefinitely if you had no air resistance, okay? So there's a lot of displacement here you can see. So we have potential energy getting converted to kinetic energy there. Now in contestant number two, the medium stiffness spring, if I put my 200 gram mass on it, release it, I could see how that potential energy, the energy stored in the spring, is converted to kinetic energy. I have this one half kx squared going into one half mv squared, back and forth. The one half kx squared gets dumped into the one half mv squared, and the one half mv squared gets dumped back into the one half kx squared. So let's get it at its resting position. Okay, you can see the difference in stiffness when they're at rest. And now let's take stiffy spring number three. And we'll attach a mass, and I'm going to try to get this to oscillate smoothly. And here you have the one half kx squared going into one half mv squared but you see it's very stiff. There's a lot of energy stored there, okay? So the big idea here is to look at the relationship uh, between the stiffness of the spring K and the potential energy and how that gets dumped into the energy of motion, translational motion in this case, one half mv squared. So at rest, this displacement's gonna be a lot less. So the least Stiff spring has the most, it will displace. The medium will be the medium amount of displacement. And then Mr. Stiffy here is not very much displacement whatsoever. Folks, with me is the energetic Dr. Seth doing some energy science here. And what do we have here to demonstrate some conservation of energy principles today? The, Max, uh, the Maxwell's wheel. Awesome. Also known as Maxwell's yo-yo yo -yo. and a rotational pendulum. And this device here is a classic demonstration in showing conservation of mechanical energy. And what we'll see is we have a flywheel uh, mounted by this axle via these cords to this frame. And we could wind up the cords to a certain position as we have marked right here. Can you show us, Dr. Seth? We're gonna wind it up and give it a potential energy from this height difference that is marked with respect to the bottom of the axle. And we're gonna hold that position what we know is we're gonna have potential energy from gravity and that potential energy from gravity, MGH or MG delta Y, the change in position, will be converted into kinetic energy, two types, rotational kinetic energy and translational kinetic energy. One half MV squared and the uh, rotational will be one half I omega squared. Okay, now watch carefully. We will see that some of the energy will leak into thermal energy. It's not a complete, perfect experiment in conservation of mechanical energy. But if we had perfect laboratory conditions, this would be yo-yoing indefinitely. Good job. So we can see potential energy slowly stops, kinetic goes back up, potential, kinetic, back up, potential, kinetic, back up. And you can see how it's slowly slowing down. And one thing you might notice is the acceleration of its descent is much slower than if it were not going to be suspended by these cords. And the question is, why is that? Well, the cords slow down its descent, 
by the rotation of the wheel. Some things to consider. Okay, so eventually we've leaked out all our energy due to non-conservative forces and our wheel comes to rest. Now there's other good experiments to do with Maxwell's wheel or topics to explore like the moment of inertia and angular mechanics, conservation of angular momentum because the cords um, produce a torque by applying a force off center with respect to the wheel. So you could look at, at analyzing the situation, applying Newton's laws and do some angular mechanics to this famous demonstration experiment as well. All right, thank you, Seth. Can you also give us one last round? All right, let's go. Wilbur Force Pendulum, invented over a hundred years ago as a demonstration in showing how translational motion can be converted to rotational motion and vice versa. Here we're looking at the energy. So what we have is translational energy of the spring, this up-down motion via this mass on the end, and the masses outward from this mass. So we have um, non-center of mass working on this, on this spring and creating a force off center of mass, a torque, and that torque is slowly converting, helping to convert that translational energy into rotational energy. Okay, so you can slowly see this up-down motion going into this rotational motion, rotational energy. And eventually we'll get all this rotational energy, but what will happen is the weight will cause it to sag, and that in itself will create more tension in the spring via the stored potential energy, which will then make it go back in this up-down motion and convert it back to translational energy. Curious demonstration here in physics in this coupled motion device. Of course, if we did this in a vacuum, it would work perfectly because we'd have no energy leaks to the surrounding air. Thank you, Mark, for your help in this wonderful demonstration. Hey there, physics folks. With me here are two little devices working on some really basic principles of conservation of energy. So here we have two cars that store energy. So the idea is potential energy, and can we get that stored energy into the energy of motion, which is kinetic energy. So there's two types of kinetic energy. There's the translational with a velocity V, and then there's the rotational kinetic energy, rotational energy of motion, which is rotational speed omega. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna line up this coil spring get some stored energy in there. Okay, it's rotating. Some of the energy is already going to rotational kinetic energy here, but I could also get it to translate. So we took that potential energy that's stored in those springs by winding it up. Those springs store that energy and release it into the rotation, the kinetic energy of rotation, the wheels, and the translational kinetic energy, which makes it translate down the table. So we have 
two types of energy of motion that that potential energy is going into. And the same with this little guy. So there's energy in small packages as well. So that one took its potential energy from the wind up of the coil, the spring, and then it converted into different kinds of energy. Sound energy with the crash, right? So there's a lot of energies in simple devices, simple everyday devices. All right, so have fun analyzing that. Let's look at energy conversions. Do these little things have energy in them? Well, these little metal balls, everything has internal energy, as we know from the E equals MC squared, right? And there's also potential energy and kinetic energy. So what kind of energy can we get out of these? Where what kind of energy transfer can we make out of these metal balls? Well, let's see, where's the hidden energy going to seep out of here? All right. Oh, wow, blasted. Looks like I made a hole. There's some heat coming out of these. Can I make enough heat to start a fire? And did you hear that sound? So it looks like we have a leakage of sound energy and heat energy, and that is from the collision that we're making. Smells like smoke in here. <laughs> so there is energy here, and where is that energy coming from? Yeah, it's stored energy, and I'm moving it. I'm taking that kinetic energy, and I'm colliding these, and that kinetic energy and internal energy are going ahead and converting into heat energy and sound energy. Hear that? There's a little... There we go. So, these are the magical energy balls and there's a lot of potential in using these. Are you ready? Yep. All right, let's go down the slippery energy slope. Okay, putting our energy principles to work here. All right, let's take a look at an example that's similar to what we've seen in the simulations in our do-it-yourself ramp setup. Let's go ahead and take a five kilogram mass, release it off the top of a six meter high incline that has an elevation angle of 35 degrees. Okay, so we can try this out and see how well our numbers match with an actual lab experiment here. Okay, so the easiest way to do this is approach it using conservation of energy. However, we could also use Newton's second law and the kinematics to solve for it. Now, a really important feature at the very beginning for part A here is that we're assuming there's no friction. So the important thing is all the conservative forces are at work here, right? So it really doesn't matter uh, whether we're going straight down or we're going to like, you know, make a, a squiggly slide out of this, right? Okay, no matter what, from this six meter height, we have a certain amount of energy. We can take any path. Uh, the path is going to be independent here. It's path independent. The energy is going to be path independent because there's no non-conservative forces. So what we're gonna say here is really important. We're gonna say the work done by non-conservative forces is equal to zero. And what that allows us to do is to say that um, our mechanical energy initially equals our mechanical energy in the final stages, okay? So what happens here is we apply, here's our diagram set up. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply conservation of not just energy, but in this case, a specific type of energy, conservation of E mechanical, okay? Which is this statement right here. 
Okay, so what are the mechanical energies at work here? So if we take a ramp and we slide something down, and this is really simple. This is not quite gonna be the same value, but we could just take an eraser and we just slide it down the ramp. That's what we're looking at, okay? And uh, we wanna identify the energies at work. So the energies here at work will be the initial energies will be our initial kinetic energy, but the type of kinetic energy here is just the slot, the translational kinetic energy. We have no rotations. So we'll say K translational plus what potential energy is involved? We have no springs yet. We could add some more springs on the bottom and some other complications here, which is typical of problems. Uh, we, we could factor those in, in in more advanced problems. But for starters, all we have is the energy stored in the gravitational field based on how high it is above its uh, the initial beginning point, what you say is a starting point. So um, my ground level here is I'm going to say this is my y initial position, which is 0, and this is my final position, which is 6. Okay. So I have potential energy stored just by having that height. So I'm going to say my gravitational potential energy initially should equal my translational kinetic energy plus my potential energy in the final state. So these are the only kinetic and potential energies I can identify in the problem. Now, alternatively, another way of saying this is all changes in kinetic energy, translational, plus all changes in my gravitational potential energy will equal zero. That's the idea. So what happens is, uh, this makes it a lot easier. So at the beginning, it's not even moving, right? It's just stationary. It's all potential energy. This is zero. This right here is the only thing at work. So what I have here is UG, and gravitational potential energy will just be MGY initial, in this case. And that will equal, now at the very bottom, so this is at the top, and this is at the bottom. I exhaust all my potential energy from the field, and this becomes zero, and it's all kinetic, just like this is all potential. So my potential energy at the top should equal my kinetic energy at the bottom, mv final. Okay. And I just use that to solve for my velocity. So my V final simply will be um, mg 2mg y initial over m. My m's cancel. And V final this is the square root of that because that's square. V final will just be the square root of 2g times my 2g, which is 9.8 times 6. And your number that you get out of all this, and without using a calculator here, <laughs> I'm going to cheat and I'm going to give the answer, which I don't have written down, so my answer will be so my answer will be, let's see, ten point eight four meters per second. Okay, now how would we do that using Newton's second law? Okay, so you can see this is the easiest way to do this, right? If we had to use Newton's second law,
might even second law, you'd have to say the sum of all your horizontal forces equals mass acceleration horizontally, and the sum of all your vertical forces equals mass acceleration of that body. Okay, so the, the complex part here would be setting up the force diagram. So you'd have to do a free body diagram. So if I did that, I would show my angle. Right here I would have my weight force coming down and I would break that down into components if I make my alignment. So it's Y, X. Okay. So if I say positive up, positive to the right and I align my y-axis with my normal force, I would have a normal force up this way. I would have a weight force pulling down this way. And my y-component of weight and then my x-component of weight. So I would have my weight my X component of weight, so if this is 35 degrees by alternate interior angles, this is 35 degrees, will be, um, WX will be sine, W sine 35, and WY will be W cosine 35. So that's my free body diagram, and that's without friction again. So my acceleration, my x direction, will be uh, proportional to the net force in that direction, which is composed of, so we have the x component of weight pulling it down, so it'll be wx, and that's the, how many value I have here, so wx, MAX are both in the negative direction, so I'm just going to um, multiply both sides by a negative. Okay, so WX will be W sine 35 equals MAX, and this weight force is just MG here. So this would give me my acceleration on the x axis, which would just be g sine 35, and I would have my acceleration, and then second, I would have to use my kinematic equations like uh, v final squared equals v initial squared plus 2. Um, a delta T, or there's several other ones to look at. So you would use your kinematic equations. Okay, and I'm just writing these down here. So the second, you use your kinematics. And you could say, V squared equals V naught squared plus 2A delta X. Now the tricky part is, is your delta X. You're going to have to do some trig to do that. This would be your delta X right here. Okay. So you would find this. And then next you would go ahead and plug in your acceleration here and then you would solve for your V. Okay, so you would need to know uh, the length of the ramp and then you would solve that using force analysis or in the second law. Okay, what's the final velocity if you have friction? So how do we do this um, in our case?
Okay, in the case of friction, what's going to happen is we know the path is going to make a difference. So each part of its journey of this mass going down the ramp, it will lose little pieces of energy, a certain amount of joules by the time it gets to the end. So we would expect a lower final velocity. So we would still use your E mechanical, initially equals E mechanical final, with the work done to non-conservative forces not equal to zero, okay? So what I'm gonna have here is I'm gonna have all my changes in kinetic energy plus all my changes in potential energy is not gonna equal zero. Instead, what that's gonna equal is work due to non-conservative forces. And in this case, this will be friction, which I could view using my understanding of how work relates, how the work relationship works. Now I'm gonna assume the work done by friction is constant, so I'm gonna say this work here will equal its force times its distance down the ramp. So I need to know what that distance is. Okay. So in my case here, what I'm going to do is my final kinetic energy minus my initial kinetic energy plus my final potential energy minus my initial potential energy will equal force of friction, and that's going to be kinetic times the distance down the ramp it transverses, which is going to play a big role, right? Because we're gonna have a lot of energy loss the more we go down here. So we know that initial kinetic energy, translational, and again, this is T, and this is gravity, gravity, okay? This is gonna be zero, and we know this one's zero. So what we have here is we have one half mv final squared, okay, minus mg y initial, that's a six with respect to the ground zero, okay, and that will equal whatever my frictional force is, it'll be uk times the frictional force, uh, it will be the frictional force, so it would be uk times the normal force, and that would be, because we know frictional force is proportional to the normal force, times your delta x, the distance down the ramp. Now we have all these numbers. Okay, we want to solve for this again. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to do a little bit of, we need to figure out what our normal force is using our force analysis just a little bit. So we would go here. And we'd say, oh, okay, we got force going down, weight force, normal force up, and the normal force will be equivalent to the y component of force, weight force. So in this case, at an angle of 35 degrees, the y component of weight force will be W, mg, um, in this case, and that would be, here's your angle, 35 degrees, cosine, of your 35 degrees theta, okay, that's what that will be. So that will be weight times your cosine theta. You plug that value in, in this case 35, and then here we need to know what our delta x is, and your delta x over here, uh, you could say if you have your um, opposite over your, this is a right angle, if you have your opposite over your hypotenuse, that would give you your sine uh, 35 value. So we know that the sine of 35 degrees is equal to uh, over height, so that would be 6 over delta x, or we could just say x in this case, and so we know that our x value will be 6 over sine 35. We plug that value in and voila, you have enough to solve for your final velocity. 
And something to experiment with is you could you know, see how the angle changes the dynamics and changes the final velocity, and also see how changing the mass will affect, if anything, that final velocity. Okay, so some important details. So you just have that extra complication when you have friction. But if you know what the non-conservative forces are in the problem, you just factor those in and do the problem. That should help you with that part of the lab. Folks, uh, we're gonna do some demos here in energy, some more demos in energy. And the idea here is to look at kinetic energy and potential energy. So here's a question for you. If I were to launch this ball upward at an angle of 45 degrees, what would its final velocity be? If I were to launch this ball straight out horizontally, uh, what would its final velocity be? And if I were to launch this ball down a ramp at 45 degrees, what would be its final velocity be? Will all these final velocities be the same? And can you show that using your conservation of energy equations? Now the problem is, is it's not very going to be a consistent force that I'm going to apply to this ball. So I'm going to try as best I can to give the same initial velocity. And we're going to repeat this experiment here with the ballistic pendulum. And we're going to launch a projectile at these three different angles of elevation. And show you in a, in a better way how to conserve your mechanical energy.